Before we dive into um, this strange new world of gender, I want to say that um, when we came to prepare this seminar, we were conscious of a number of challenges. Uh, first, of course, this is a hugely controversial topic. Um, secondly, it's a sensitive topic. One Christian leader has written, gender confusion concerns the very core of our being. Our gender identity is fundamental to our self-knowledge. A biblical response to the what he calls the transgender revolution, what we're calling the gender revolution, will require the church to develop new skills of compassion and understanding. And third, I'm conscious that across Europe, the impact of gender ideology, or again, what we're calling the gender revolution, varies greatly, as do attitudes within our various home countries. And um, fourthly, uh, this issue is complex. And looking around the, the room in this group, I, I, I hope and I expect there'll be some who have walked alongside people struggling with their gender, others who've wrestled with how to pastor a local church in our changing context. The speed of change in the last few years has been so fast that we are all finding our way. So the gender revolution, we live in a day where the question, what is a woman, has become controversial. Our slide shows two competing definitions. On the left, a woman is an adult human female. Um, standing for women is a reference to the website from which I took that definition. On the right, a definition supplied by the LGBT Foundation. A woman is someone who identifies as a woman. And the definition goes on. Many women are cisgender, often written as cis, and this means the gender they were assigned at birth matches their gender identity. Some women are transgender, often written as trans, and this means that the gender they were assigned at birth didn't match their gender identity. Cis women and trans women are women. It's as simple as that. Bruce, now Caitlyn Jenner, launched a new TV show, I Am Kate, a few years ago. And in the trailer, Jenner looked forward to the day when people in Jenner's situation would be normal and just blend into society. A conversation partner says, you are normal. And Jenna replies, put it this way, I am the new normal. We can dive into this strange new world by taking a look at the gender unicorn. In the middle, the graphic refers to sex assigned at birth, a phrase we will interrogate later. Equal prominence is given to male, female, and other or intersex. In fact, now some, claim, some now claim that biological sex, far from being binary, should be regarded as operating along a spectrum. Above that, the gender unicorn refers to gender identity and gender expression. Gender identity is a key concept. It's been defined as each person's deeply felt internal and individual experience of gender, which may or may not correspond with the sex assigned at birth. Gender identity is located in the unicorn's mind, or as Chaz Bono once put it, gender is between your ears and not between your legs. Three possible types of identity are shown, somewhere on a female spectrum, somewhere on a male spectrum, or somewhere on a spectrum of other genders. Gender expression, just below, refers to the way that people express their gender identity to the world through their mannerisms and clothing and personal presentation, and there's likewise on three spectrums in the, in the diagram. The word transgender is, one might say, an umbrella term for persons whose gender identity, gender expression, or behavior does not conform to that typically associated with the sex to which they were assigned at birth. Stonewall, a UK charity for LGBT plus inclusion, says trans people may describe themselves as using one or more of a wide variety of terms, including transgender, transsexual, gender queer, gender fluid, non-binary, gender variant, cross-dresser, genderless, agender, non-gender, third gender, bi-gender, trans man, trans woman, and so on. I recently heard a medical expert say that this umbrella term includes people who once would have been described as transsexuals, people who seek permanent bodily changes, Transvestites, people who like to wear clothes, makeup, or hairstyles that transgress normal gender norms. 
people with certain types of fetish, and increasingly, people who occupy a kind of youth subculture, similar to goths or punks in the past. Let's turn now to three big picture observations about the gender revolution. First, it's important to distinguish between gender dysphoria and gender ideology. Gender dysphoria is a medical diagnosis made when someone experiences distress or discomfort because of a mismatch between their inner sense of gender identity and their biological sex. Meanwhile, gender ideology promotes a whole new paradigm, a cluster of theories which shape thinking about sex and gender. It is perfectly possible for a person to be transgender without any experience of gender dysphoria. Second, it's helpful to see the gender revolution as an expression of a struggle felt by many today to find and express personal identity. When the actor Laverne Cox, a trans woman, was interviewed by Time magazine a few years ago, Laverne Cox said, more and more trans people want to come forward and say, this is who I am. But behind these personal identity questions, lie deep philo philosophical questions about the human person. What or where is the real me? And how do I discover that? In turn, these personal identity issues contribute to a broader social movement as trans activists and their allies push for the normalization of new approaches to gender and sexuality in schools and universities, workplaces, and so on organizing, uh, getting to, the, to organize themselves in relation to issues of gender and sexuality in new ways. I think this is quite an important slide um, for us to grapple with the situation in which we find ourselves. This slide, I think, illustrates the complexity of the challenge facing us. We're responding not just to individuals, but to, new, to institutions that are approaching um, life in new ways. And the gender revolution has many overlapping faces. There's a medical dimension represented by the word illness. There's a pastoral dimension as people seek to define their own, own identity. There's an intellectual dimension as ideologies and worldviews clash. And there's a challenging dimension as intolerance creates new pressures. In many places, Christians find themselves in a new social and political environment which is both baffling and challenging. Recently, um, a teacher in Wales, Mr. Ben Dybowski, Polish by birth, had been encouraged at a, div at, a, at a diversity training day to share his views. Yet after sharing his views as a Christian on marriage and abortion, he was promptly fired from his job. He was another victim of cancel culture. Who is affected? by the gender revolution. I want to suggest that two people, two, there are two groups of people, whether people of faith or not, who are probably the most affected, namely women and children. So biological sex being real, men and women are different. And sometimes this matters, especially for women, for women in sport, where biological males have a built-in advantage, in the need for safe spaces, when women will or may feel vulnerable if trans women are present places like rape crisis centers, prisons, changing rooms at the gym, and maybe just being able to freely meet with people of your own sex. And also in the area of language, most women feel erased or insulted when described as menstruators, people with cervixes or chest feeders. Meanwhile, growing numbers of children are undergoing life-changing medical and surgical interventions, and already some are coming to regret what has happened to them. Meanwhile, childhood is being made more confusing, more complicated. To the question, who am I? Children are in effect being told, only you can say, and even your body cannot give you any help here. This slide um, shows uh, the, in diagrammatic form the uh, results for uh, a 2019 survey carried out by the European Commission asking the question, do you think that transgender persons should be able to change their civil documents to match their inner gender identity? The percentage of people replying yes ranged from 83% in Spain, that's on the far right, your far left, to 12% in Bulgaria. 
The UK was one of 18 countries in which a majority replied yes. Yet earlier this year, when the Scottish Parliament passed its gender recognition reform bill, opinion polls indicated that two thirds of the public were opposed to this change. Why the difference in outcome? First, the debate has begun to move on. Since 2020, there has been a growing pushback against gender ideology. And secondly, the question, because legislation was under consideration, the question had become more real, more practical, and the public was paying closer attention to the real world downsides, especially for women. And this slide refers to something called the Yogyakarta principles. Um, a group of experts in law, health, and human rights um, met in Yogyakarta, Indonesia in 2006 and published these principles in the following year. And, and these enshrine the concept of self-defined gender identity. And although without any official legal status, their influence has been widespread within the United Nations, at the European Commission for Human Rights, and elsewhere. And the, the concept of gender identity, which is so central to the gender revolution, I think represents the convergence of overlapping ideas with different histories. So first, there's the idea that our internal experience is of paramount importance in forming our sense of who we truly are and how we should live. Um, Philip Reef, a uh, sociologist and, and now passed on, coined the phrase psychological man to highlight this inward turn and to distinguish modern man from his historic forebears. Um, political man, religious man, economic man. This emphasis on the internal self as our authentic self has deep roots in Western culture. By contrast, the idea that gender um, is not only distinct from sex, but something entirely detachable from sex is a much more modern phenomenon. You might find ancient parallels, but um, in, the, in, in, in the West, it, it's a story really to be found in the evolution of feminism in the 20th century. Author of The Second Sex is famous for her saying, one is not born but rather becomes a woman. She meant that gender is a social construct. Differences in opportunity and aspiration, patterns of social interaction are learned from one's culture. So the feminist might respond with the slogan, biology is not destiny. Um, however, since the 1980s, under the influence of postmodernism, a good deal of feminist writing has curiously question whether there is a stable category of woman. For Judith Butler, author of Gender Trouble, gender is a performative accomplishment, a performance typically carried out unconsciously in response to a script supplied by society and which creates the illusion that men and women exist. And I say illusion because for Judith Butler, even sex is to be understood as a social construct. What she means by that is that the body has no intrinsic meaning. If the difference between men and women has traditionally been treated as significant, that is because societies have chosen to do so. In reality, differences in our sexual organs are no more significant than differences in eye color or hair color. Once you take that view, gender has no anchor in sex at all. There's nothing to anchor it in. Third, alongside this emerges the idea in queer theory that the gender binary is to be dismantled. For the gender binary is rigid, arbitrary, oppressive, an external structure imposed on individuals by the dominant narratives of society. So resistance to the gender binary has ultimately a goal that lies elsewhere. The aim is to smash heteronormativity. The notion that heterosexuality is normal is dissolved by acid if the gender binary can be dismantled. And finally and briefly, the phrase sex assigned at birth captures at one and the same time a dismissive attitude to science that is characteristic of queer theory and a preoccupation with the power of language to shape our experience of the world. So in this case, a doctor, an authority figure within our culture imposes a label on us at birth. If we move to the next slide, I just want to suggest in the briefest way two deep roots to the phenomenon we face. And the first we've already touched on, it's the idea of the rise and triumph of the modern self, expressive individualism, the authentic self. This film poster about um, 
uh, the, a, a Danish man who sought to transition in, I think, the 1930s, has the strapline, find the courage to be yourself. We have a, 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 over two centuries, really, um, the um, persistent attempt to uh, pursue freedom from authority, whether that's um, or, or the authority of nature or the authority of rules. And this film, a few years old now, um, called Zootopia, um, was, uh, portrayed a city where animals lived in harmony because the predators had overcome their um, unhelpful natural instincts of eating other animals. Um, and the strapline for the city was where anyone can be anything. And then a hint, too, of um, the authentic self again, Shakira, who sang the theme tune, uh, try everything, um, said, I wanted to be involved with this film because its message is, you do you. So there's, those two themes have deep root, the, 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 uh, the desire to move to freedom from authority, freedom from nature, and the expression of the authentic self. We're going to move on now um, to um, the Bible. And... Um, I want to begin with these words. In the beginning, God. That is the foundation which changes everything. Glyn Harrison wrote a book um, called A Better Story, an attempt to model how Christians can talk about sexual ethics and the purpose of sex in a way that can engage with um, contemporary secular audiences. And he suggested a particular mode of conversation a posture, if you will, in which God welcomes, reveals, nurtures. He offered five foundational statements in the context of discussions on sexual ethics, but they apply as much, I think, to discussions of gender identity. Um, here are those five foundational statements. God has spoken. You don't have to figure it out. You don't have to figure it all out for yourself. God welcomes you into a reality of his making, not yours. We flourish as human beings when we work with, not against, the grain of God's reality. God not only reveals who he is, but he reveals who we are as well. And then last, and hugely importantly, no matter what happens, God is good. Um, and that may be a helpful posture for us to have in mind. Um, I'm now going to think about the theme of our bodies matter. And I just want to draw attention to the fact that um, in the biblical accounts, the making of human beings and our embodied life is emphasized. The creation accounts stress our materiality. The man is formed from the dust, the woman from the man's side. Uh, the uh, physical differences of the man and the woman are affirmed by the fact that they're created in different ways. And this uh, emphasis reaches a high point when Adam <coughs> sees Eve for the first time and cries out, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Our bodies are not things we inhabit, a kind of sleeve around the real me. Rather, they are the way we inhabit the world as the kind of creatures God has made us. Indeed, Paul in 1 Corinthians 6 can use the expression you and your body interchangeably. I think it's important to note that our bodies give us clues to deeper realities. We are tempted to imagine that radical autonomy is a possibility for us. But our bodies mock that idea as ridiculous. Our bodily life is dependent on resources which must come from beyond us. The air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, our bodies reveal to us that we are and cannot be anything but dependent creatures. The theme of the body as a gift and as a given. Our status as God's image bearers and our bodies come to us as a gift from the generous hand of God. We didn't make or choose our sexed bodies, but we can either embrace and rejoice in God's gift to us or resent or resist his gift. 
Our birth sex as male or female is a given in another way. We can go to great lengths to mask it, but ultimately we cannot change it. If one theme within the transgender narrative is the idea of liberation from constraints that restrict or oppose us, we need to remember that Christianity has a distinctive understanding of freedom. True freedom is not found by seeking to overcome the constraints of nature or moral norms, but in fulfilling the purposes for which God has made us and become, becoming the person God intends us to be. There's a discussion about what freedom looks like in this area. Turning to salvation history in the body on the next slide, the human race's dramatic attempt to establish autonomy fractured humanity's relationship with God and our neighbor. But more than that, there was an impact on our relationship with nature and the self. The human person is intended by God to be an integrated whole, body, mind, and soul. But the entry of sin into the world opened the door to disintegration and so to psychological suffering in its various forms. So there is a givenness to our sex and gender, but there's a brokenness too, a brokenness in which we all share in some way or another. The Christian account of salvation underlines the value and significance of the body. When Jesus came to our world, he took on human flesh and affirmed the dignity of the human body. He won salvation for us by suffering in his body, Salvation in Christ offers to turn our disintegration into wholeness and the prospect of a resurrection body. Moving on now to sex and gender. Claire Smith, an Australian author, wrote not long ago that the task of understanding what scripture has to say about personhood, sex and gender is a work in progress. She is, in my view, entirely correct to sound that note of caution and to call for further reflection. Male and female, he made them. The creation of human, humankind is announced in the words you see on the screen. We should notice the parallelism between the line, in the image of God, he created them, and the next line, male and female, he created them. We're given, being given a strong hint here that our maleness and femaleness contribute to our capacity to reflect God as is in, in uh, the image of God. Um, and we should notice too that these verses underpin the unity of the human race. No distinctions are mentioned except for one, the distinction between male and female. So when Judith Butler suggests that bodily differences between men and women are no more significant than the differences of hair color, she could not be more wrong. Sexual difference is part of the goodness, the very goodness of creation. Turning to Genesis 2 and reading what Adam said when God brought the first woman to him, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. We learn something important about our bodies and about language. A writer called Abigail Favale writes, Genesis 2 emphasizes another vital principle for body, sorry, another vital principle. For the body reveals the person. Our bodies are the visible reality through which we manifest our hidden inner life. The first couple have not yet spoken. She has not verbally introduced herself. Her body speaks the truth of her identity. And this truth is immediately recognized by the man who is struck with joy and wonder at the revelation of a person with whom he can, at last, have communion. And we should notice, too, that as the man uses language to name what, or rather, who God has created, this principle emerges. Divine speech makes reality. Human speech identifies reality. So reality exists prior to naming it. And language is true and meaningful when it corresponds to what exists. In other words, at a fundamental level, this constructionist view of language, the idea, for example, that sex is assigned at birth, completely clashes with the pattern provided for us in Genesis 2. There, human language does not define reality. Rather, human language is intended to respond to and correspond to the reality which God has made. 
Finally, I think it's worth noting that a biblical account of sex and gender has to be undertaken on a broader canvas than the debate in our culture around us. Our culture looks at biology, at society, at psychology. But from a biblical perspective, we have to trace sex and gender back to ultimate reality, God himself and the fact that we uh, bear his image. We also discern a divine pattern for human life in our bodies. They are signposts to the fact that we are made for relationship with others, relationships of reciprocal self-giving. And we look forward to our future destiny when at the last day the marriage of Christ and his bride, the church, will take place. Marriage, made possible by our bodies, points towards that great day. We're going to turn now uh, to look at gender expression. And I think I want to say that it's interesting to to my mind that although the Bible could not be clearer that God has established a binary division between male and female, it is perhaps surprisingly somewhat reticent about the specific content of masculinity and femininity. Now, there's a big debate going on about that in Christian circles, but I was struck by an article I read recently. Andrew Bunt, uh, an English author, said, as I read the New Testament, I don't read that men are called to marriage. Some are single. I don't read that men are called to masculinity. I do read that men are called to maturity. In the New Testament, the longest single passage dealing with gender is 1 Corinthians 11, 2 to 16. I'd like to draw attention to three features of that passage. First, it's notoriously difficult to interpret. We can read it again and again and again and still be unsure whether we've got to the bottom of what Paul is trying to say. Personally, I think there's something to be learned about gender from the fact that Paul's discussion of it is only partly fathomable. Secondly, Paul discusses at some length an issue which relates to the way women dress and present themselves when the church gathers for worship. Paul deploys one argument after another, yet interestingly, he does not issue a command. Instead, he says to the church at Corinth in verse 13, judge for yourselves. And thirdly, as Paul develops his argument, it's striking that he reflects on man and woman in in creation, in Christ, and in contemporary culture. Tentatively, one might suggest that these three lenses point towards differentiation, interdependence, and reputation, respectively. But the key takeaway is that any discussion of gender and gender expression needs to wrestle with the implications of these three distinct lenses or arenas uh, which we simultaneously inhabit. I'd just like to draw attention to the verses on eunuchs in in, in the Bible. In Matthew 19, Jesus affirms the binary division of the human race into male and female as the creator's intention. Yet moments later, he points out that some are born eunuchs, some are made eunuchs, and some choose to be eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. Christians can sometimes affirm male-female distinctions as normative in a way that with insensitivity brushes aside the reality of lives with a complicated relationship with those categories. However, as the example of Jesus shows us, it is possible to uphold the reality of a divine pattern rather than bowing to contemporary pressures to reinvent theological understandings of sex and gender, while making space in our thinking for people and situations which do not fit tidily into that pattern. Have you noticed, too, that there is a wonderful feature of the New Testament, namely that after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, the first convert brought to our attention as an individual is someone whose sex and gender fall outside the normal male-female binary. It is, of course, the Ethiopian eunuch. And if you read through the Bible references listed in the handout, you will see that for eunuchs, the trajectory of the Bible is a journey from exclusion through exile and prophetic promise, but leading ultimately to inclusion. We're going to touch briefly on identity and creation and in Christ. 
Um, we're familiar with the, foundation, the idea that the foundation for our identity is the profound truth that each of us is made in the image of God. And this all by itself gives each of us priceless value, immense dignity, profound signif significance. Human idolatry tends, leads to a tendency to locate our identity in something other than God and our status as his image bearers. It might be family, nation, religion, achievement, wealth, but we live in a culture which encourages some people at least to locate their identity in sexuality or gender. Wonderfully, when a person turns to Christ, we receive from him a new identity arising out of our union with him. All of this is familiar and precious, but I want to suggest that our practical theology of identity needs to be unfolded beyond this. Here are just a few thoughts to begin such a journey. First, I think, we need to place more emphasis on identity and community. I sometimes wonder whether discussions about identity which focus on the fact that each person is made in the image of God and we have a new identity in Christ may sometimes be affected by an echo of the individualism in our culture. I want to suggest that we need to place greater emphasis on our identity and relationship. Yes, in relationship to Christ. Yes, in relationship to God our Father, but also in relationship with our fellow believers as a member of the family of God, part of the holy nation and royal priesthood. I think there's some value in seeking to unpack what we might call the various dimensions of our identity in Christ. This isn't exhaustive, but it occurs to me that it's a personal identity. Jesus calls his sheep by name. It's a relational identity. We become children of God and join the family of believers. It's an eternal identity. Looking back, we were chosen by God before the creation of the world. If I am a Christian, I can affirm that my personal history did not begin with my conscious experience of myself or my gender. Looking forward in heaven, Jesus will give each of us a new name known only to us. It's a dynamic identity. We are being transformed into the likeness of Christ as we work out our salvation. Yes, we receive an identity from God in creation, in providence, in Christ, in community. But how exactly this unfolds is partly in our own hands. Touching then on the pathway to salvation and suffering and hope, struggling and healing. This side of heaven, as Paul writes in Romans 8, we groan inwardly as we wait for the redemption of our bodies. The Christian Medical Fellowship in the UK published a paper on gender dysphoria some time ago and wrote this. To those wrestling with gender confliction and incongruence, as with all disorders, the gospel brings hope that the God who made us male and female can realign distorted identity and bring increasing coherence between sex and gender, even if such healing may not always be fully realized in this life. The path of Christian maturity is often one of learning to honor Christ in the midst of our struggles, waiting and trusting. Wonderfully, a day will come when our struggles will be over. I want, by way of epilogue, to um, make three suggestions about forming our response to the gender revolution. The first is this, that Christians are called to love. And I was very struck when uh, I first came across the fact that um, the noun in the New Testament for hospitality is a compound word. If, um, if it's made out of the words love and stranger. Now, Christians are called to practice hospitality, to love the stranger, to love those, in other words, who are not quite like us. Christians are also called to love our enemies, to bless those who persecute us. Um, Carl Truman has written a book called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, and he gestures towards three priorities in his view for the church at this time. One, because so much moral argument goes on in our culture on the basis of emotion, feeling, and preference, he says it's vital for the church not to follow that pathway, but to remember to base our moral reasoning on scripture, and he would say to reclaim the value of the natural law. Secondly, um, 
he uh, urges that as a church, we need to recover a sense of the importance of human embodiment, not just because of transgenderism, but because of humanism, because as the gentleman said earlier, that the definition of what it means to be human is under threat. And it's under threat particularly in areas that relate to our human embodiment. And thirdly, he argues that partly because of the social pressures we've been hearing about the, the, the soft totalitarianism, and partly because we live in a very individualistic culture, that we need to place much more emphasis on building rich and deep communities. And last of all, um, the first little book that came out in the UK, to my knowledge, from Christians uh, from an evangelical background on transgender, just a little pocket, back, pocket book, and, and it said at the end, here are three priorities. We might add a fourth now. First, compassion. Second, conviction. Third, wisdom. I would gloss those. Compassion, yes, but with respect. Compassion makes people uh, look as though they're only in need. They haven't made choices for themselves. So compassion with respect. Conviction, yes, but conviction with sensitivity to the feelings of others. And thirdly, wisdom. Wisdom particularly in handling relationships well. We might add a fourth. Courage, albeit courage with kindness. <laughs>